All right. So at the very beginning of our kind of discussion on thermodynamics, I mentioned and why we needed to talk about enthalpy and entropy is because both of them are required to evaluate equilibrium in a given reaction. And so um, now we get to that point. We've talked about enthalpy. We've talked about entropy. So now let's put that together for free energy. And again, free energy is a kind of defined or made up construct. And we're going to be looking at specifically Gibbs free energy. There are other types, but we're going to focus in this lecture on uh, Gibbs. And so uh, we typically uh, classify that with a capital G. And so we define Gibbs free energy, capital G, so again, three means define as enthalpy H minus T S. This is our this is our definition. This is how we define Gibbs free energy, and you'll see that we define it in this reason. Um, we define it in this way for a particular reason. So this is for a given um, state. Um, so typically, what we're looking for is the change between states, right? So if we're looking at a chemical reaction, you know, what happens before and after the reaction? And so we want to look at the delta. And so for the change between discrete states, we have delta G. So now we're using the capital to indicate um, that we have discrete states uh, of matter. And then that is going to be equal to delta H minus T delta S. Right, so this might be the, oops, sorry about that. This might be the um, the definition that you've seen for Gibbs free energy. And now the reason we define it this way is because equilibrium, which is what we strive to look at, uh, occurs when the change in Gibbs free energy, the delta equals zero. And this is for a system at constant temperature and pressure. So the reason we use Gibbs free energy as opposed to other free energies like Helmholtz, for example, is because for materials processes, temperature and pressure are typical uh, variables that we deal with. Um, you know, we are looking at a uh, process for making steel or ceramics or whatever it may be. We're looking at uh, the temperature, and then pressure is um, almost always uh, constant when we're dealing again with atmospheric uh, conditions. And so those are um, variables that make Gibbs free energy. Uh, define the way it is. And so at looking at temperature and pressure, if those are constant, um, then if this is zero, if the change in G is zero, that means equilibrium has occurred. So that's the importance uh, of, of this quantity Gibbs free energy. And a, a couple of points to make here is that um, Gibbs free energy, it's a, what we call extensive property. So if you remember what that is from thermo or other classes, it means it's dependent. It depends on the size of the system. So in general, this isn't a great thing, right? Because if we have one reaction somewhere uh, that is one mole, and then another place, it's a uh, thousand moles, whatever you know, whatever the the size of that system may be, then um, it's hard to compare those, right? And so typically, what we do is this uh, Gibbs free energy is uh, typically normalized by either moles, so how many atoms are in it, or by mass. So typically what you're going to see in this class is by moles, uh, but it can also be normalized by mass as well. And so this is going to naturally lead us to uh, another concept known as chemical potential. All right, so chemical potential 
we define that as the work that would be required, and I apologize for the focus here, to remove an atom from the bulk of an uncharged solid. to infinity, so basically infinitely far away from it. So basically we have a solid and we want to look at what happens, the work required to take an atom out of that solid and move it very far away uh, so the solid doesn't experience any force related to it. And so this is all done at, again, constant temperature, and I'll just abbreviate that, and pressure. So the other thing about this is we also keep all other chemical components and so we call those J, uh, basically the J component um, in the system fixed. So basically we, we remove one atom or chemical component I, but we, do, we keep everything else, J and, and so forth, other components the same. So those are all fixed. And so um, the way we um, so then we, uh, mathematically how we define this is the chemical potential. This is uh, the Greek letter mu, so it's a lowercase I believe, uh, and then sub i, because that's our component i, um, is equal to the partial differential with, uh, of Gibbs free energy with respect to the change in number of moles, or the number of uh, I atoms. So we're basically looking at how Gibbs free energy changes when you change the component I. And both of these uh, small deltas uh, mean that we're looking at a very small change, right? One atom, the smallest way we can change it. And then the subscript here are P, T, and J, because those are the things that are being held constant. And just like we do in a lot of cases, we define um, the chemical potential to uh, the standard state as kind of a reference point for all of our calculations. That's what we did with enthalpy. That's what we did with entropy. And so that's what we're going to do here. So we look at the chemical pot potential of a component I is equal to the chemical potential of that component I in its standard state plus RT natural log of AI. So let's go over these uh, components here. So again, this is the chemical potential of component I. This is the same thing, chemical potential of component I, but at its standard state. And then uh, this is the universal gas constant, R. So it's a constant. This is temperature, T. Um, and then this um, A here, this is the activity, what we de uh, define as the activity of uh, component I. So this essentially, um, activity now we've defined something new and why we've defined it is because it allows us to determine um, the, sort of the difference between that and the standard state and so activity is a way to measure a species such as component I 
effective, what we term effective concentration in a mixture. Again, with reference to what we term the an ideal case. So if this doesn't make sense right now, we're going to kind of go through and give some examples uh, of what this means. All right, so we're defining activity as this effective concentration in a mixture. And again, we're referencing it to the ideal case. So uh, we, if we want to talk about the activity of a component I, we can actually relate it to its concentration, right? That, that way it's an effective concentration. So in that way, we define the activity of a component I as the uh, product of these two terms. So again, activity of A, and this is um, defined as what's called the activity coefficient. of the component I, and then this here, x, this is my mole fraction of component I. So we've had to define one more thing, the activity coefficient, but this allows us to relate the activity, the effective concentration, to the actual concentration or mole fraction of that component. All right, so here's where we get to the comparison. So if a component's activity matches with its mole fraction, then this activity coefficient here is going to be equal to one, or what we call unity. And so that's the ideal case, right? So if activity uh, equals the um, mole fraction, or AI equals XI, then that means that, you know, we, we just take this expression here, and rearrange it, right? That would mean these two are the same, then this has to be equal to one, right? And so this is known again as unity. Um, and this means that this is what we term um, an ideal solution. So if basically in this expression of chemical potential, if this term activity acts which is referred to as the effective concentration, if it acts like the mole fraction and therefore is the same, then this activity coefficient is equal to one and it's what we call an ideal solution. So it acts like we would expect it to because it has the same mole fraction. And so deviation from this, from one, is going to tell us about um, deviation from this ideal solution behavior one way um, or the other and so that's what the activity coefficient gives us all right so just a couple uh, notes here um, so if we're talking about a pure element at its standard state then its activity is, again, what we call unity, or that activity is equal to one. And so therefore, let me start over. So therefore, the chemical potential is that of the standard state. 
So another um, important piece of information that I want to make sure you're aware of is that this thing we call activity coefficient Sorry about that. So this thing we call the activity coefficient is a function of composition. Sorry about the the focusing here. There we go. Camera lost it for a second. Um, so activity coefficient is a function of composition. Um, all right, so the other part um, that I want to go over is when we have a solution, and again, we called it ideal. So when a solution is ideal, or the other part of that is it can also be considered dilute enough such that the atoms don't interact with each other. Then the activity coefficient can be taken as a constant. And so that is, uh, in that case, we have activity of I is equal to the activity coefficient of I standard state, or sorry, the not here, and then Xi. That's again the mole fraction. And so this here, this activity coefficient that we put the not on um, here, this is known as the Henrian activity coefficient because it follows Henry's law, uh, and that means it's not a function of composition. So that kind of simplifies the expression. If it is ideal um, or if it's very dilute such that atoms um, aren't really close enough to interact with each other. And again, just to formalize it for ideal solutions, the activity, activity coefficient of the component i is equal to 1, which is the same as the mole fraction. And the activity is the same as the mole fraction.